Yes, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, Sergei, for the kind introduction. And it's quite an honor for me to be a speaker here at the uh, 25th anniversary of the uh, <clears throat> Russian Academy of Science. Also, I didn't understand your first part of the introduction. Unfortunately, I don't speak Russian. But uh, what I want to do, I want to give you an, uh, yes, a few on the numerical approaches to uh, represent particle-laden multiphase flow for industrial applications. And uh, I have start, structure, uh, structured my talk into these uh, sections. First, I want to talk a bit about the challenges, then about grid resolution for CFD, DEM interaction and coupling. Then I, uh, in order to uh, <coughs> speed up calculations, I'm going to talk about reduced order models and in the same uh, line, high, or high performance computing before I then uh, show you some uh, large-scale applications uh, with industrial relevance. And I'm going to finish then with a summary. Yes, going back to the challenges, I mean, particulate material is present in everyday life. You see here some of the predominant applications in agriculture, in uh, mining, in uh, pharmaceutical applications, biomass, and so on. And uh, one of the <coughs> challenges that we're facing with uh, particle-laden flow or particles in contact with flow is basically that in most of the applications we're dealing with non-spherical particles, so be it cylindrical particles like pellets or whatever you can think of. And then usually these particles don't have a uh, uniform size. They are, uh, have a size distribution that spans sometimes uh, orders of magnitudes in terms of the uh, relevant length scale for the particles. Then uh, if you want to couple between continuous method and discrete method, the essential part that you have to take care of is, the is to use reliable correlations for heat, mass, and momentum transfer for both spherical and non-spherical particles. And uh, for spherical particles, we have a lot of correlations for heat, mass, and momentum transfer. But for non-spherical particles, there, is, uh, there are still some gaps. Then uh, what is usually the case in industrial application, we have a large number of particles in the simulation domain. And uh, we have an interaction for various flow phenomena that is basically single phase flow, free surface flow, multi phase flow, turbulent flow, and other different uh, flow applications that you can think of. And uh, the next thing is basically in order to cover all these applications, <coughs> there is basically the question of the available of the software that can do this job and then support and expertise in terms of uh, the new. Uh, challenging uh, coupling between uh, particulate material and uh, flow. Then, yes, the requirements that we would like to have in order to attack this problem is basically have a fast CFD and DEM solver with an efficient parallelization to uh, have the results not only in weeks, but, only in, uh, but rather in uh, hours or days. Yes, preferably a workflow environment that you just press return and you get at the end the uh, project report. Low license, fee, low license fee or no license fee, and then, of course, perfectly or uh, preferred as well a GPU support fee for DM, but that is um, always with some question mark, mark attached. Then, yes, coming first back to the particle geometry, so the shape of the particles, I mean, what I'm uh, here is basically oh, yeah, the effort and the complexity of the uh, shapes. So, I mean, of course, the simplest uh, particle shape is the spherical particles. And you can basically uh, deal with the contact detection, detection quite easily. And then if you, but if you then go to higher geometries, for example, if you want to have a cylindrical shape, then you can use the approach to uh, represent or resolve the cylindrical shape with particles, so basically filling the shape with particles. The advantage of this approach is that you can still use your contact, alg uh, contact algorithm for uh, neighbor detection uh, that you have used for simple spherical particles, because here you can loop over all the particles and do the same contact, uh, or use the same contact algorithm for the uh, contact. Yes, that allows you to represent here uh, already a large number of uh, relevant geometries and thus replication, so from disk-like to uh, cube-like, torus-like, or elliptical-like, and all uh, things like that. Another approach uh, is basically if you use, if you represent particle shapes, by a super quadratic approach, because this way you can basically, with about uh, six or three parameters, you can cover a large range of particle uh, shapes or geometries that is shown here. Depending on the parameter settings, you cover a large uh, range. However, of course, here for these shapes, the contact detection is more contact detection is uh, more uh, <coughs> you know, requires a higher effort. 
because it's not as simple as for the uh, spherical particles. And then the last bit is, of course, you can represent particles here with a uh, triangulated surface. That's from the complexity. You are, yes, the highest, uh, I think, the highest uh, level you can reach. But of course, it requires as well the highest effort to do contact detection between the triangles, and that is really that uh, uh, or limits your uh, DM simulation to only a few hundred or few thousand uh, particles. Then, yes, another important question is basically the grid resolution for the CFD and the uh, DM interaction, and there are basically three, uh, three different approaches available or not available can be uh, taken uh, for representing this kind of uh, flow systems. The first one is the porous media approach. The second one is the dual grid concept, and then the immersed boundary method. And uh, basically, if we're looking at a simple application here, you have here basically ice particles. You have here warm water coming in from the left side. And we're having here already, in order to get these things properly predicted, we have here basically first heat transfer between the flow and the uh, ice particles. Then, of course, when the uh, ice is melting, we're having a mass transfer from uh, molten ice into the uh, flow. And secondly, we have an exchange of momentum between the flow and the particles because these ice particles, basically, uh, since they are lighter than, lighter than, I don't find the other point, yes. Since they are lighter than uh, water, they are floating on the uh, top of the uh, water surface. And secondly, we have the track forces acting on the particle. And what you see here as well, <coughs> is the uh, nice uh, baby of the flow, because the flow always takes the uh, path of the lowest resistance, so most of the water <coughs> is uh, leaving the domain uh, underneath the particles. And that means basically we have to talk about the grid resolution, because you have to represent the flow appropriately and accurately. And so you have to resolve the flow accurately in order to predict momentum, heat, and uh, mass transfer, because if you don't resolve the flow properly, all kind of transfer mechanisms between the particles and the uh, flow is going to be, uh, as well, very inaccurate. That means, basically, we have the uh, unresolved, that's the poorest media approach, that means the cell size of the part uh, has to be bigger than the particle size, and basically what you see here, that the particles filling the uh, CFD cells and uh, the CFD, basically the flow is seeing the particles as a kind of porous media. That means a porosity with the uh, permeability uh, for this kind of uh, configuration. And then the resolved approach is either the dual grid approach, the immersed boundary method, or direct numerical simulation. That means a body fitted grid around the particles. But I'm not talking about this approach here, because that is basically yes, uh, a traditional uh, CFD where you uh, general, have a huge effort to generate the grid, and then you can uh, the predict the flow around the particles. And that means basically for this kind of approach that is shown here. You have then either the dual grid approach or immersed boundary method that allows you then to do a very accurate flow prediction inside the back bed or around the particles. Yeah, so that means basically if you're following this approach is an application for a combustion chamber, you have here inside the combustion chamber the particles moving through the um, combustion chamber and basically what the uh, grid or what the CFD side is going to see is a porous media and that basically means that in these cells you have a porosity that is smaller than one, whereas in all the other where you have pure gas flow you have a porosity of uh, one. And that is basically you see shown the porosity distribution because you know all the particle uh, positions and you know as well the shape, the volume of the particles, that means you can easily add up the particle volume and uh, related to the uh, cell volume and then it means basically defines the porosity and has this advantage that you predict an accurate porosity profile during the whole simulation when the particles are moving or when you have a packed bed and you don't have to introduce a porosity <coughs> correlation if you do a pure uh, CFD or a two-phase uh, or two-fluid approach. Then uh, the dual grid concept, because I mean, the, uh, what I mentioned beforehand, these uh, approaches, of course, you are limited with the uh, grid resolution because you have always to take the grid size bigger than the particle size. And of course, if you want to resolve the flow properly, usually you have to refine your grid. And that means sometimes, or a lot of times, that means that you have to use a grid size that is smaller than the particle size. So in this case, the porous media approach doesn't work. And we have developed here a uh, dual grid concept 
That means basically <coughs> we're de dealing with two grids, one grid, the fine grid is dealing with the uh, flow, so you have a fine grid for solving the flow, the turbulent flow or whatever kind of uh, flow application you are dealing with. And we have a coarser grid <coughs> that is uh, responsible for the coupling between the particles and the flow. So basically on a coarse grid we predict then the heat, mass and momentum transfer between the particle and the flow and this <coughs> coupling or mass or transfer <coughs> properties are going to be mapped onto the fine grid where we then do an uh, appropriate flow calculation. And that means basically the application I'm showing here is basically a, a breaking, wave from, breaking wave from this side including particles and uh, what I'm showing here is basically the non-dimensional time and the non-dimensional kinetic energy for different grid resolutions you see here basically uh, that is uh, 48,000 elements, that's a single scale and we have now done, we're doing now a refinement and we follow the uh, distribution of the, uh, or the evolution of the kinetic energy. That means basically if we refine the grid once, we have this distribution of the uh, kinetic energy so we still haven't received a uh, grid independent uh, resolution of the flow. We do a further refinement, then uh, we get um, yes, still some uh, variation in the uh, kinetic energy and if we do a further refinement we see that we here that with 500,000 uh, elements we have uh, received a uh, grid independent solution because the previous solution and this solution are more or less coinciding and that means basically <coughs> in this case we are already below the particle size and using the dual grid approach in order to do the transfer of the properties uh, between the particles and the flow and that means basically when we <coughs> compare or when we compare with experimental uh, data what was most measured during the experiment was the position A, B and C of the uh, breaking wave. You see here the particles of the breaking wave on the other wall coming from this side. So that was the position of the breaking wave and you see here basically the X and Y coordinates of uh, these uh, three figures and you see basically here the coarse grid, that's the red bars, we're having there an error of about yes 25% Whereas if we resolve the grid, uh, when, uh, whereas when we resolve the flow properly, we have a uh, drastic reduction of the error to uh, less than 5%. I think this was barely 3%. <clears throat> so that is basically an important feature that for this particle laden flow you have, the requirement is that you have to resolve the uh, fluid properties properly and accurately in order to do, <coughs> in order to do an uh, accurate prediction and more important to uh, predict accurately the uh, transfer mechanism between the particle and the, uh, and the fluid. So the other approach to do that is the immersed boundary method. Basically the immersed boundary method is if you have very com uh, complex uh, geometries they would basically require a lot of effort in uh, the uh, grid generation and uh, it's basically uh, that uh, <clears throat> when you have very complex geometries, of course, grid, uh, grid generation requires a large effort. And uh, with the immersed boundary, you just have an uh, orthogonal and uh, uniform, even uh, yes, even a uniform grid for the whole domain. And uh, what you do basically is that <clears throat> you have here the fluid domain and you have here the gray part is the uh, boundary or the uh, solid part. And what you basically do, you trying to manipulate the, uh, these cut cells where we have the bound, uh, where we have the solid part or the object uh, cutting these cells, what you do with these cells, you take a new momentum equation and you manipulate the momentum equation with a force term on the right hand side so that this force term is representing the influence of this wall of the object inside your CFD domain. And uh, basically if you do that, you take this uh, cell, you cut the cell and you take the volume or the remaining volume into account and you, as I already mentioned, you manipulate the Navier Stokes <coughs> equation for these cells in such a way that it is reflecting the uh, influence of the uh, wall of the object. And that means basically you have basically an, uh, a scalar <coughs> indicator, lambda, and this scale indicator is for the fluid is zero and for the uh, solid part where you have the object is one and then of course in the cut cells this, uh, uh, this uh, scalar value is between zero and one and using this scalar lambda in order to interpolate <coughs> properties between the uh, solid body and the fluid approach. And uh, for example if you use this one you can uh, uh, quite accurately predict the wake behind the cylinder here. You see here basically an uh, comparison with the experiments, I think I take this one, the experiments, 
these are the experimental values and here the predicted values and we have quite a very good uh, agreement between experiment and predictions. The same for the uh, <coughs> vortex street behind the cylinder. As well here, the uh, <coughs> comparison between the uh, track coefficients and the uh, Struhal number, here the predictions and here the, uh, uh, the uh, experimental uh, measurements. And as well here, a very good agreement between the uh, experiments and the uh, measurements. And the same, of course, the, uh, the large advantage of the uh, immersed boundary method is that you can use <coughs> different objects of or different uh, particle shapes and you can predict basically the uh, resistance, the track coefficients for different Reynolds number and this way basically you can have different configurations or different orientations of these particles and you can evaluate the CD coefficients that you then later on can plug into your uh, application for evaluating the CD coefficient without this kind of uh, refined solution with the uh, immersed boundary method because the uh, Hierarchy is really for the course or for porous, porous media approach. You have the less effort in computational time. And of course, for the I, I immersed boundary method, you have to uh, calculate or have to take into account a large effort in uh, computational resources. So that basically what I already ma uh, mentioned, you can basically get track coefficient versus Reynolds number. That's really why the way you get then a correlation for your track coefficient. And of course, similar, you can as well evaluate then the uh, heat and mass transfer in <coughs> and define a correlation for the Nusselt number and for the uh, Sherwood one number to define then mass transfer if you, un in, if you don't use your resolved approach by with the immersed boundary method. So that brings me basically now to the uh, chapter of the reduced order models. And um, yes, I already mentioned that uh, these particle laden flows with a large number of particles and of course in this case as well usually a uh, large grid, I mean a lot, uh, high number of uh, CFD cells, it needs uh, computational resources but on the other hand the big potential is here that you get a very very detailed uh, description of the physics inside your domain uh, taking into account reaction, chemical reactions, flow instabilities all and all other uh, effects that might be relevant for your application and that of course gives you <coughs> with these detailed result a good insight into the underlying physics and from there of course once you understand the physics of the flow from my point of view it's then useful or then only then you should start with uh, reduced order modeling because as long as you don't know what are the relevant effects in your system or the dominating effects it is no use to start any kind of reduced order modeling because you might be um, doing reduced order modeling for parameters that have only a minor influence on your, for on, on your uh, system. So that means basically one approach that we developed was the representative particle method. And if you look into such a uh, reactor here, so that was basically here, a simple reactor with some flow coming in from the side. Here you see basically the uh, flow going up here and you see here basically what is shown here, the particle surface temperature, the particle temperature distribution, the gas temperature distribution. And if you look at uh, such a reactor with a packed bed and you take a particle, then you see basically that the neighborhood of this particle, the thermodynamic state is not much different. That means that obviously is the, uh, what we ex would expect from uh, pure reasoning that a particle and its neighborhood is not very different in the thermodynamic state. And that allows us to uh, apply the representative particle method. That means basically you do a detailed calculation or you estimate the thermodynamic state for one particle based on the uh, conservation equation and conservation laws and then <coughs> you interpolate this state onto the other particles. Basically, you, what you do, you pack a number of particles, 10, 20 or 30 particles together in one parcel, and uh, you do a calculation of one particle in this parcel, and the rest is interpolated on the, on the uh, this thermodynamic state of this one particle is then interpolated on the other particles in this parcel or in this package. And that basically, if we do that, we have done here, yes, an, uh, <coughs> an uh, exercise, I mean what you see here, the scaling factor is basically indicating how many parcels we take together to, cl uh, to uh, class them in one uh, parcel. One of course is the resolved calculation where we do the calculation for each particle and of course that is the uh, speed up and the error of course in this case here the speed up is of course we have taken as that as a, rel uh, as a reference case so the speed or the effort is 100% and the error obviously is zero. And then if we group three, four, six, or 12 particles into one package, 
That of course reduces the computational error, uh, the computational load quite lots. You see here basically that we're having here for 12 particles in one package, we have an upscaling or a speed or a reduction of the uh, computational resources by a factor of 10. And uh, you see that we only, with this approach, we're having only a moderate error of here, maximum of 3.5%. So in general, what is our experience with this approach? We uh, generating an, an error that is less than 3%, and that's uh, usually taking into account all the other sources of error is uh, sufficient for an uh, accurate prediction of uh, these particle-laden flows. And if you, we compare here the evolution of the mean temperature versus non-dimensional time, you see that we're having for the different scaling factors, 1, 3, 4, 6, and 12, that we're having a quite a good agreement uh, between the uh, mean temperature. Of course, the mean temperature is not a kind of a relevant uh, parameter for the uh, complete uh, computational domain, but just here is shown uh, the, uh, <coughs> the uh, prediction or the uh, comparison, and that is as well uh, undermining what I showed in previously in the uh, previous slide, that the error is uh, very moderate if we're applying this representative particle method. Then, that comes quite along with the reduced particle method, or is going into the same direction, is to reduce the uh, computational load for these particle laden flows. And uh, basically, uh, the challenges for this CFD uh, DM coupling are the following. We do a combination of different independent software because we basically, in XDM, we're not um, developing any kind of software that will for the uh, CFD part or if we need other physical effects, we're taking, I mean, our working horse is uh, open foam for this uh, purpose. So we're taking open foam and coupling XDM, so the particle processes to open foam. And uh, the particle is not really very uh, choosy where the uh, CFD comes from. It could, for, for that reason, could be any other kind of uh, CFD uh, software. We have as well a coupling to Fluent. But I mean, uh, open foam has the advantage. We have access to the source code. We have a lot of expertise with open foam, and it doesn't cost us any license. And then, um, yes, we have a large volume of data to exchange, because if you think about, flu uh, for example, fluidized bed applications, you have particles all over the sim simulation domain, and that means basically we have to couple a lot of data, or we have to exchange a lot of data between the uh, flow and the uh, particles. <coughs> and um, this is as well um, coming as well along, because for these fluidized bed applications, or in general, if you have moving particles, the particles moving quite Yes, fast around in the simulation domain, and that means you have to track always your particles and have, have to, uh, to see where the particles couple to the uh, fluid domain. And the, yes, <coughs> uh, then as well, the different uh, distribution of the computation and of the data, and then as I already mentioned, uh, the DM data sometimes is very dynamic. That means we have a very dynamic process to uh, catch for the heat, mass, and momentum transfer between the particles and the fluid flow. And uh, classical approaches that we have, that um, if you take the two software modules, a big DM code, or in principle any kind of uh, coupling between uh, different software modules, each module is partitioned with its own partition, uh, uh, partition uh, options, and then you have usually a data exchange in a peer-to-peer -peer model. That means basically um, that all the day, usually what uh, is the uh, consequence of that is that you have to change, exchange all the data between the modules. And of course, that means a, com a large communication overhead. What is not required if you do a proper, or an, uh, what we do in a, a partitioned uh, concept that takes the, uh, what I wanted to say, these approaches into account. That means you cannot leave the partitioning for each module independently. You have to somehow get an overarching concept that affects or is um, telling each module how it has to partition in order to come to a uh, very effective uh, load balancing and, as I say, uh, <coughs> uh, less communication overhead. So basically, the classical coupling is, you, is like that. You do uh, partitioning of the CFD domain. You do partitioning of the DM domain, and you see here, if you do it like that, you have already a very big disadvantage because you have to communicate between the partitions one prime and three prime and between partitions in the DM domain of one and two. And that already means that you have a lot of uh, communication overhead that is uh, not required if you do a proper partitioning. And this way here, 
yes, you basically have to do to communicate all par all pro uh, have to communicate all partition data to all other partitions. That means basically every data goes to every partition, and that basically <coughs> usually results in an unpredictable pattern and a large volume of communication. What we want to avoid because we want to do high performance computing and not uh, communication. And if you do what we call the collocated partition strategy, that means you have an overarching, co overarching concept for the modules. And then it looks basically like that, that you do here a uh, partitioning, that's the partition in the uh, DEM domain and the CFD domain, simply speaking, are the same. And then, of course, this way you reduce the communication to a large extent, and uh, that gives you, only this concept gives you the really high performance on a supercomputer. And that means basically we have here basically uh, just an uh, estimation. The number of nodes we used here, 10, 20, and 40 percent, and the overhead was basically only 1 percent of the uh, for the communication, or 2.3 percent for uh, for the communication, as compared to the total uh, computational time needed. And if we uh, compare that to other solutions from literature, if we're taking MFIX as well, in a module that deals with particle and fluid flow. We, the M fix, then we're having an increase of 160 percent from 64 to 460, uh, 265 processor. That means basically above 64 processor of course, the uh, parallelization is not useful anymore. So you cannot really exploit the completely HPC, HPC performance of M fix. Or if you're taking CD foam, we're having an overhead <coughs> in a communication of plus 50 percent if we increase the number of processors from 128 to 512 uh, cores. And uh, that is due to a large increase of the peer-to-peer -peer communication, meaning that you do a lot of overhead, and if you, if the more processes or partitions you take, the more communication data you have you to manage, and that, of course, increases then exponentially if you increase the number of processors. So just here, damp break with particles, that means basically here, that is basically an, an example here with, uh, I think, two and a half or three million particles and 10 million CFD cells. And if you're looking at the scalability of this example here, we have still a <coughs> good scalability of almost 70% up to number of cores of 2,000. We couldn't use more cores because that was really the um, maximum number we were allowed to use in our cluster. And that was already uh, blocking the cluster for all other users <coughs> for, uh, I think, half a night. Yes, then now I'm coming after all these explanations about the, uh, ex uh, the uh, coupling between DM and CFD. I'm coming to some large scale application. So, here first, the great furnace that is uh, biomass combustion in collaboration with the uh, University of Pisa. What you have here basically from this side, the biomass is coming in, transported over the uh, forward acting grate. From here, you have an inflow of primary air for the combustion, the drying process. So here we have drying process, the pyrolysis, and here the combustion process. And then we have here secondary air injection, and here in this part, we have uh, flue gas recirculation. And what we're going to predict here is basically the particle motion here along the grate, and then the flow, the interaction, heat, mass, and momentum transfer between the particles and the flow. And the big advantage, as already mentioned, is that if you're looking here at the grate, and the particles moving on the grate, these particles are going to mix here, going to be on the surface for some time. And if the particles, you can imagine in such a combustion chamber, if the particles are on the surface of the back bed, they receive a radiation flux from the walls, from the hot walls. And that's what you see here, basically represent uh, one particle picked out during the simulation. You see here basically the particle starts with uh, 400 uh, Kelvin, and then it is moved to the surface of the pack bed, receive a flux, and means the surface temperature is increasing and heat is diffusing inside the particle. Then it's coming again mixed into the pack bed, and it sees basically a cooling effect due to the uh, primary air coming from the bottom and the felt in contact with other particles and radiation to other particles. And then at some stage, it receives again a radiative flux because it's again on the, on the surface of the pack bed, and you can basically trace the history of each single particle what it is going to see during his lifetime in, uh, for such a DM CFD coupling. And that, of course, gives you a large in, uh, amount of information, and only then processing this information <coughs> reveals then the underlying physics or the real physics between the flow and the particles. And you see here as well here the distribution inside the particle during the drying period. So maybe you see here the drying temperature arise until approximately 300, uh, yes, 300 uh, Kelvin, 
then here the temperature stays at a plateau-like uh, region because during the evaporation or the drying process when you evaporate water, the temperature is not rising further. And you see here basically the reduction of the... Uh, <coughs> Uh, oh, sorry for the, the resolution. I can, uh, yes, you see basically the beginning we have it uh, moisture all over the particle. You see barely with the drying front or the evaporation front moving through the particle, the uh, moisture count or the moisture content is reduced down here, and that means barely the drying process of the particle. And basically, here is shown the biomass combustion of forward acting grade. You basically see here basically coming in the uh, particles moving over the grate, and you see here basically these low frequency fluctuations that you see as well if you uh, observe a normal natural fire with wood. These low frequency fluctuations are caused because of the moving por or the changing porosity in space and time of the part of the uh, back of the moving bed here, and you see basically here now this red is the CO emissions coming from the pyrolysis of the particle. Here is the flow distribution as well. <clears throat> and you see here that uh, we can do relevant uh, combustion, or not combustion times, but we can uh, use relevant simulation times uh, for such an application. And uh, this was done with only, I think, yes, 10 cores. And the, uh, basically, the ratio between one second real time and uh, the uh, time used on the, on the uh, cluster was, I think, about something 1 to 10 to 15. That means, barely we need 15, 20 seconds on the computer to predict one second real time. And then he is coming to one of the, uh, I think, biggest reactor that we know on uh, in the science, especially the XDM for the blast furnace. So we basically use the uh, XDM code to predict the heat up drying and reduction of the uh, iron ore inside the blast furnace then <coughs> softening and melting in the cohesive zone, the multiphase flow in the dripping zone, because here you produce liquid iron and slag that is trickling down and gathering here at the bottom of the uh, furnace. Then here, the tuyere with the uh, raceway, where we inject uh, either pulverized coal, but anyway, a very hot gas that is <coughs> producing carbon monoxide from the coke particles that is then used here in this part of the blast furnace to reduce the, um, what I wanted to say, the iron ore or the iron, iron oxides, and then at the bottom here, the dead man and the melt fool with the stratification of iron and slag. And I'm just showing here you now some, yes, well, that is what the blast furnace looks like. The uh, velocity distribution here is at the raceway, and then here the particle size is boost over the You see here these red kind of particles is coke, and the blue here are the uh, iron ore particles. So you have a kind of layered structure inside the blast furnace that then is moving slowly down in order to uh, produce then liquid slag and liquid iron. Yes, and the shaft process of the uh, iron, uh, or, or iron oxide reduction is basically heating up of the particle material, drying, and then the transport of the reducing agent CO or H hydrogen uh, as required for new, uh, newer technologies, and then the reduction of iron ore. And you see here basically for one particle extracted the uh, distribution or the evolution of the uh, mass fraction for iron because we're starting with uh, iron oxide and you see here again basically a front depending on the temperature moving through the particle and reducing the iron oxide and then you at the, at, at the end of the uh, time uh, you produce then uh, the uh, mass fraction of uh, iron. And all these applications or reduction processes have been validated, and that's another big advantage of this approach because you can do this uh, validation usually on one particle. You take laboratory experiments under a defined environment <coughs> concerning temperature and gas uh, distribution, and you can basically, and this validation exp uh, exercise is uh, very fast because the computational time is negligible and you can use uh, optimization tools like Dakota, for example, in order to uh, define the or determine the kinetic parameters for your reduction process with what we have done here. And you see here basically a uh, validation experiment for all the reduction processes for different temperature of iron, ox uh, iron ore. And then, of course, once you have done, uh, done this validation for the oxidation uh, reduction process, you can predict basically the evolution of these different uh, iron ore components inside a particle versus time. And then once you have done that for one particle, you can duplicate or not uh, replicate this validated model for all the particles in your blast furnace or in other kind of application. 
and uh, the particle only sees different boundary conditions, and the boundary conditions barely define what is happening inside the particle with your validated approach. Yes, here basically the softening and melting of the in the cohesive zone. So you see here basically the layer of the uh, layer of the cohesive zone. And you see here that the particle is becoming soft with higher temperature here, and then at some stage we produce here uh, liquid slag, and here liquid iron that is then flowing or trickling down through the uh, packed bed of the pound coke particles and then gathering here at the bottom and you see very already here that iron usually has a lower viscosity than slag and therefore is uh, flowing down uh, or streaming down or trickling down much faster than slag. And you see here as well in this application how the uh, gas is affected by this effects in the cohesive zone. You see here basically the uh, softening of the particles and melting of the particles and of course that is has a large effect on the porosity of the of these zones and you see now how the flow is redirected due to the change in the porosity that most of or a lot of uh, great part of the uh, gas flow is going here through the center whereas only little is going through these uh, molten and softening zones inside the blast furnace and uh, that is one of yes, like that you can really resolve the physics inside your reactor and understand why things happen or why things don't happen. Yes, and then later on, yes, that's the, um, what I wanted to say, the zone below the uh, cohesive zone where we have basically uh, the liquid slag and liquid iron uh, trickling down. That's just a uh, distribution. And here we have basically the liquid iron and the liquid so barely here you see the inflow from the raceway so an injection of gas into the raceway and here basically we produce in the cohesive zone due to the melting process liquid slag and liquid iron and you see here basically at the bottom that is uh, now here uh, liquid oh that was too fast but you, anyway you're ending up with a uh, stratified distribution of liquid slag and liquid iron and the slag, liquid slag you find on top of the iron because it's lighter than uh, iron and one of the last applications is coming to the race rate formation you have here strong interaction between or violent interaction between the particles and the uh, and the flow because the injecting velocity is around something like 200 meter per second at a, at a temperature of about 1800 Kelvin and you see basically the formation of the raceway for different inlet velocity of 200 meters per second, 180 meters per second, and obviously for 180 meters per second you have much smaller raceway volume than for a larger velocity. And that you can as well study in detail uh, during the formation. So starting here you see the interaction of uh, very violent interaction between the particles and the uh, flow, and you get as well all this detailed information about <coughs> that you don't only have a uh, formation here, but you have as well some formation at the bottom of the injection, uh, injected gas that has as well a strong effect on the uh, flow distribution as well the reduction process in the uh, raceway. And then last but not least, a similar application as additive manufacturing. You have here the same physical process. You have particles much smaller. You pass a laser over the surface and you melt them and that will you produce liquid iron that is then solidifying again within the additive manufacturing process. That brings me now to the end of my presentation and the summary. First message is that all these things are going to be made available quite soon, most probably this year, because I have initiated a in, uh, coupling between Rocky DM that is basically taking part or taking care of the motion of the particles. Fluon is responsible for the uh, CFD and the reactive flow and XDM, the thermodynamic module, is predicting the particle processes that I've uh, shown you uh, some of them here are doing this presentation and that brings me to the summary that uh, XDM or in general the coupling between DM and, and CFD is a novel and advanced simulation framework for multi-physics application that describes the particulate phase under thermal and mechanical load and this way we have as well an interaction with heat mass and momentum transfer and but I already mentioned during the presentation that the CFD DM approach for this kind of application offers an unprecedented <coughs> unprecedented insight into the underlying physics and if you combine this with algorithms like reduced, or reduced order modeling or HPC you can reach into industrial applications and last but not least we have then this way a broad application spe spectra for high, with a high potential for adaptation and extension and the acknowledgement uh, this research was funded by the National, uh, Luxembourg National Research Fund a European project powder rack 
an interact project, and of course the HPC center in, uh, at the University of Luxembourg, to which I keep a very good relationship because I need them very often. Yes, thank you very much for your attention, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you very much. In general, the interaction between particles uh, in terms, I mean, yes, in terms of being really particles, the strongest interaction that particles have is heat transfer. And uh, there we have basically uh, three mechanisms of heat transfer. That's first conduction if particles are in contact. So you have conductive heat transfer between the particles. Then the uh, second uh, interaction is between the flow and the particles. That's the traditional convective heat transfer. Uh, defined by an, uh, in the e simplest way by a heat transfer coefficient or Nusselt law. And the um, third interaction between the particles is radiation at higher temperature. That means particle, a particle is going to exchange a radiative heat flux with the neighbors. Yes. Sorry. My question is about yeah. well, uh, when we take a package. Yeah. One, mm. one, yeah. So a package of or yeah. Something. And, we, uh, and when we, uh, this particle is mm. very uh, uh, yeah. Okay, yes, no, I understand. Yes, I mean, we can only take them to into account this me transfer mechanisms between packages. So that is the reason why you introduce, of course, a kind of error. You don't get anything for free. I mean, if you want to have an uh, accurate uh, results, you have to do uh, each particle separately. But I mean, that is what we have to pay if we do the uh, representative particle method that we're losing some accuracy. Yes, please. Uh, you mentioned that open form is your working work course, yeah. but um, uh, you show that uh, NCS is uh, used to, to uh, model uh, this uh, SLM applications or something like that. So, what are you using? <coughs> what packages do you use? I'm using open form. This, I mean, the uh, open form. We have to put uh, the big opportunity that we can control and we can verify what we're doing. If you want to do an, this kind of de development in open and fluent, I think it's, um, yes, um, an exercise that's going to drive you crazy because you have only the UDF. And once we know how we do the coupling, we can define then or can write easily this UDF and uh, then we can use open foam or um, we're not using open foam a lot. Uh, it's usually uh, uh, partners that prefer to use fluent rather than open foam for, for the one or the other reasons. In the SLM application, yeah. so you've told that it will be available in open form? Yeah, I mean, the, what, I show, what I showed here for the SLM application, it's done with open form. I mean, what, I show, what I've shown here, all the applications were done in open form. Because if I use Fluent, I have to pay license as well. Only academic license, but uh, I still have to pay license for the usage, and uh, of course, I'm avoiding that as much as possible. Uh, I have a question regarding the case with a biomass reactor. Yeah. So you showed us uh, some example. Is it a modern reactor or it's a real industrial one? No, that was an, uh, is a real industrial reactor about, as I think, a length of 8 meters. And it was a collaboration with the University of Pisa or in, uh, in particular with uh, the Italian electricity company Enel. They're using uh, this kind of uh, biomass reactor for cogeneration of uh, heat with biomass. So that was a real, uh, yes, industrial application where we used this method to uh, predict, yes, temperature distribution and in particular uh, with this approach with the secondary air injection and uh, exhaust gas recirculation to see the effect on the emissions. Yeah. I have one question. What, what is the maximum number of particles you have ever used? The maximum number of particles I've ever used was, I think, about uh, 10 million. 10 million, yeah. <coughs> Есть еще вопросы? Тогда, я думаю, у нас будет возможность задать вопросы во время Курпи Брейка, во время Ведьмана Перерыва. So, I think that uh, we have an opportunity to ask you more questions during the coffee break yeah. or at yeah. lunch time. So, I would like to thank Professor Becker. Peters, a uh, very, uh, very powerful professor, for my opinion. He has a lot of potential projects. He work, works very actively now with his uh, colleagues, PhD students, Master of Science. So let's thank the professor.
better preparers for coming to Moscow to Russia.